Hi, and welcome to Speaking of Faith, occasional conversations about faith, life, and so much in between. My name is Chris Holmes. I'm the Stemler Scholar in Residence and one of the pastors on staff at First Presbyterian Church of Atlanta. And I'm joined today by Karen Wright Marsh, uh, a friend of this congregation and also the director of Theological Horizons, which is an organization in Charlottesville, Virginia, which provides Christians and seekers in, academy, in the academy uh, a welcoming community to explore their their life and faith and thought. Um, and for this, this conversation, I'm wanting us to focus on the topic of spiritual formation, something you know something about, you've written about. And I wonder if you might start by defining spiritual formation or your understanding of spiritual formation for those who may not be familiar with the concept or maybe not with your concept of spiritual formation. Yeah, I've been thinking about that because it's, it's kind of intimidating, spiritual formation. Yeah. It sounds like it's going to be discipline. Mm -hmm. It's going to be hard. It's certainly not going to be fun. No you know, fun. It's good for no you, fun. but yeah. you should do it. <laughs> you it's like eating it. broccoli. Yeah. Um, but I'm going to go back to um, two desires that we have. You know, we want it, whether we reckon with it or not, we, we desire to be in the presence of God, and we long to be more and more ourselves in light of God's grace. So I think I see two sort of two elements here becoming closer to God, being more aware of God's presence, mm -hmm. because God is present, yeah. you know, grow in an awareness there, and also to become more of who God created us to be. I love Thomas Merton's quote when he says, to be a saint is to be myself. Yeah. You know, it's not going to look like you uh, or the next person, but spiritual formation is a way of growing. It's, it's a life of vitality. So yeah. I think it's more inviting than maybe I thought at the beginning. Yeah, yeah, I think it's Richard War, but I could be wrong, who talks about spiritual formation is dealing with the shadow self, you know, yes. the, the false yeah. self. And mm -hmm. so many of us um, are not aware of our false selves until we take time to calm down or to, to look inside and say, man, all that anxiety, all of that, that pressure is me trying to protect something that's not me. Yeah. And so right. spiritual f formation is an invitation to uh, who we really are. I, I like that a lot. Mm -hmm. um, as, you, as you think about your own life, um, who are some of the people or the resources that have shaped you and your spiritual life and your own spiritual formation? I think um, that actually telling the stories of these vintage saints and sinners yeah. has shaped me so much because I'm reading their words. I'm repeating their insights. Um, of course, scripture has formed me, mm -hmm. um, but I think by telling the stories, it's sort of worked on me. Yeah. Um, and so when Julian of Norwich says, all will be well, you know, sin is inevitable, but all will be well. Um, part of me uh, begins to believe that. Yeah. Um, I do think that for me, repetition is, it, it, it is very helpful, whether it's liturgy, whether it's poetry, whether it's song. Um, yeah. I'm a singer. Yeah. Um, so those words and beauty, art, um, get at different parts of myself that have been very helpful, I think, in, uh, in these daily invitations yeah. to be formed. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah. So kind of returning to your first question, uh, this idea that spiritual formation is hard, like eating your vegetables. Um, one of the things that I personally have experienced and struggled with is that there's often this ideal of the spiritual, spiritually formed person. And usually this includes selling all that you own, leaving your family and your work, and moving out to the desert to focus exclusively on God. And so while that might have worked for our church fathers and mothers, our nuns and our monks, it's not been realistic for me. My family on most days would miss me. <laughs> and so what does spiritual formation look like for everyday people who live ordinary lives of work and relationship and rest and so forth? Yeah, yeah St Simon Stylites actually did live on a, on a pole for yeah. th 37 years, but yeah, <laughs> It's not for me. It's not for everyone. Uh, and there are days I, I would love to live in a, in a convent, actually, and just mm -hmm. get away from my, my family. But um, I, and I grew up in a tradition where quiet time, you know, a, a great quick Christian wasn't a monk or a nun, but they did look like, you know, quiet time every morning for an hour and a half, um, church attendance whenever check services box, were on. Check, 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 check. check. Um, so I think even though the monastic and sort of Catholic traditions, uh, standards of piety uh, are not for me, I have other voices speaking into me is that, you know, spirituality looks like this. Um, 
But I have just come to this um, more and more this realization that, you know, God is seeking me out. So the invitation is to uh, pay attention, to uh, respond to the little invitations. Um, Annie Dillard says, how we spend our days is how we spend our lives. Mm. So uh, spiritual formation or, um, you know, the spiritual life is not a huge program that I commit to forever. It's, it's waking up in the morning um, and becoming aware of God's invitation. Yeah. Um, again, another person who has influenced me is Thomas Merton, yeah. and he talks about the seeds, that God is planting seeds, almost like a dandelion, you know, blowing mm. God's presence throughout my day, and I can walk right through it and ignore it, but um, in each moment, I have the opportunity to turn um, and see God and be formed in that. I love that. I love that. The, the language about awareness or attention reminds me of, of one of my teachers, Luke Johnson, who uh, in one of his books says that spiritual formation is the asceticism of attention. It is the, about training ourselves to pay attention to what God is doing in our lives and in the world. And yet I don't need to tell you that we live in a life, uh, in a world of constant noise and distraction and whether that's social media or busy schedules or carpools or kids or meals, we are living busy lives. And so I, I wonder, how have you found ways to pay attention to God in the midst of all of that? What does it look like to do spiritual formation in the age of the smartphone? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, part of what we do on Fridays with this vintage lunch is we Everyone gets, gathers their plates and piles it high with homemade comfort food. And then we sit down and for two, I ring the bell and for two minutes we have silence. And it feels like such a long two minutes, yeah. but it's so beautiful. And I remind everyone, you have many opportunities. You, know, there, you have a two minute, probably more, when you're walking from one class to another, yeah. when you're washing the dishes, when you're brushing your teeth. We have opportunities to choose to pay attention and yeah. to choose silence. But I also say, look, your distraction is nothing new. Yeah, right. uh, Thomas Kelly, who wrote Testament of Devotion, this wonderful Quaker writer, it cracks me up and I read this to students because in 1941, he says, oh, we all complain because we're so distracted by telephones and automobiles <laughs> who have just ruined our lives yeah. because we, we can't live these spiritual lives. And he said, our problems are not external. Yeah. Our problems are internal. Yeah. And that we do what we desire to do. And that if we choose to experience the presence of God and we make time for that, we can do it. Yeah. So this, the problem is not external. I mean, I think students, we all feel more and more bound because there's more presence of distraction. You know, that walk with a dog is not the quiet walk that it was mm -hmm. 15 years ago. Yeah. So it's more on us, I think, to choose to pay attention. But yeah. Rabbi Heschel says to be, um, to pay attention is to be amazed. Yeah. So will we be amazed? Yeah. Yeah. The, I don't remember who it was, but somebody gave the idea that, that theologians should, you know, are the, the people who are captivated by wonder, you know, that yes. that's what it means to be a theologian mm -hmm. is to be amazed at the world. Um, yeah. And, and that comes through making these decisions, day to day decisions, minute by minute decisions to pay attention and be amazed by what God is doing. Yeah. The last semester, the whole series was on everyday invitations. Mm -hmm. And so I was presenting, uh, and with Heschel's uh, quote, to be spiritual is to be amazed, I'm like, choose this. You know, at the end of the day, try the examine prayer. So I taught them the examine prayer, which is very brief yeah. from St. Ignatius. Um, holy listening, you know, asking a really good question of someone, and then truly listening. So offering up spiritual invitations that don't look like the old disciplines of fasting and prayer. And those are valid. Those are part of, you know, part of the invitation. But there's so many more micro decisions, micro invitations that just kind of let everybody relax a little. And, yeah. you know, just try this. Yeah. It's kind of playful. I love that. Mm -hmm. Playful and spiritual formation. Who thought? Yeah. Well, thank you, Karen, for your conversation on spiritual formation. Super helpful, I know, to me and, and I'm sure to the people who are watching along. And, thank uh, you. Thank you for joining us again for this installment of Speaking of Faith. Hopefully it was uh, something that you'll take with you in your own spiritual life. Thanks again for joining us.